so much. Uh, and uh, thanks, uh, my esteemed panelists. I heard her uh, waking you guys up. So hopefully, we'll be able to engage with you a little better. I know it's the last session of the day. So let's try and make it mo much more entertaining. Yeah. OK, so the topic uh, for us uh, is cross-channel integration. Are we audible till the last? Am I audible? OK. So uh, the topic in itself says that uh, we have to be where the customer is or our consumer is. And consumer today is omnichannel. He or she is available everywhere. They're consuming content looking at education programs, interacting with the e-commerce platforms or our products or brands everywhere. So as a brand, is it a problem? Yeah, <coughs> is it better? Yeah. All right, thank you. So um, as a brand, as a, as a brand custodian uh, uh, running the campaigns of our uh, clients, we should be there across all the channels, all uh, it should be omnipresent uh, experience for our consumers. So we will start with uh, uh, with uh, with our panelists. Um, what are the benefits that they are seeing when they are using cross uh, channel integration? So I'll start. This is an open question to the panel. So maybe we can start with you. Fair enough. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity uh, to be present. Uh, with the esteemed panel here, uh, really excited to share some insights and learning. Uh, I think uh, the benefits, uh, modern consumers today interact with a lot of touch points across multiple channels. Uh, there's a marketing principle which states that it requires seven or more touch points to uh, make somebody internalize your brand or take an action towards your brand. Um, I think in, in, in that context, uh, since there are so many touch points out there, there are so many advertising platforms out there, there is so much content to consume for an individual, uh, it becomes essential that there is a consistency and relevancy with respect to what you put out there. Uh, I think uh, what consistency and relevancy does is, uh, it, it helps your brand message, messaging uh, be heard, uh, consistency creates experience which is seamless in nature and not fragmented for a user uh, and which adds on to let's say better ad recall or better brand awareness and uh, maybe customer loyalty. I think uh, uh, that's the key benefits of uh, uh, cross channel for me and what cross channel also enables us is to focus more on integrated analytics. Uh, what I mean by integrated analytics is to understand what consumers' behaviors are across platforms and uh, how they shape up uh, a brand's image or equity in the mind space of a consumer. Um, and that adds a lot of value. I think we are able to assess our campaigns better, the measurement uh, is better and we are able to, let's say, invest uh, strategically into channels uh, which give us better ROI. So I think for me, I think these two stand out uh, in terms of consistency with respect to messaging and second is uh, enabling integrated analytics. Yeah, no, absolutely. The consumers are not looking at channels in isolation. They are experiencing the brand across uh, all the channels. So Sahil, what has been your experience and how have you used uh, uh, cross-channel integration? Uh, thank you, first of all, again, uh, uh, thank you E4M and thank you, ma'am, uh, for uh, having us here. Uh, I think I will start with uh, some context on the life insurance industry that I represent. Uh, you know, so I think uh, a little bit of context in terms of uh, uh, the consumer, uh, the buying habits, and uh, you know, what it takes to actually build uh, the level of trust that we're looking at. See, first of all, uh, a life insurance relationship is actually a 10 to 40 years car relationship. A lot of marriages don't last these days, you know, it's not lumber. Uh, so, so there is a consistent, you know, level of trust that you have to build to actually, you know, uh, allude the customer and to tell them how, how trustworthy is the brand. Uh, second, the product itself is quite complex. Uh, you know, how many of you would really know what a term insurance or a probably a non-par savings insurance is? It's a very technical and, uh, product. It's difficult to understand. And hence, there is a lot of education that's required uh, for, uh, you know, such kind of a product entry. 
Uh, third, uh, even the journeys it's, uh, no, itself are really long. So there's a, there are almost uh, uh, 70 to 80 form fields that you have to fill uh, and, and there are also you know, post uh, payment kind of you know, onboarding challenges that are there. So, so there's a consistent engagement that's required uh, from the brand side. So having said that, uh, with all these challenges, actually the cross uh, you know, uh, channel uh, kind of uh, media really help us, uh, helps us stitch all of these you know, uh, journeys, st steps, stages and eventually lead a seamless uh, experience to the customer that enables us to educate, that enables us to engage, keep on engaging and eventually le leads us to you know, uh, better conversion. So that's how the cross uh, channel engagement really helps us. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Shivalika, from an OH perspective, uh, uh, how do you see the clients fitting OH into this cross-channel integration for you? And this is good. Thank you. Uh, thank you, E4M. Thank you, ma'am, for the question. Um, I think uh, while uh, from a sales perspective and uh, coming on to straight on to that uh, everybody else is and specifically I hats off to media planners and marketers who actually have to go through and meet hundreds of the vendors out there in the market and try and create a, a complex world of a digital ecosystem to fit into a complete user journey and while we're talking about ROIs and measurements, uh, DOH again comes as an emerging platform. I remember selling TikTok five years back where and I literally had to beg for YouTube budget and nobody was even aware of what short media platform is. And as the consumer pattern and journey and the understanding has evolved over the period of time, there is a separate line item and budgets altogether for OTT, CTVs. These are evolved mediums. OH on the contrary and DOH on the contrary is still an emerging format. So while if I'll go to Sahil or Omkar, they'll say, hey, ek aur naya channel aaya hai. So um, from that empathy perspective and understanding what a marketer is looking at, on an average, one individual actually get exposed to two to three digital screens. And digital out of home has been always a black box when it comes to measurability, reporting, etc. So Lemma envisioned it seven years back. We are digitizing the offline audiences to online audiences and kind of uh, fitting us into that cross-channel integration in a way so that marketeers like these can actually have a full funnel approach from top to bottom. They can actually have users' attention gained at multiple touch points, be it on one-to-one -one or a one-to-many screen. So that is how DOH or a programmatic DOH is majorly playing a role. Thanks. Uh, Shuchi, has it made your life more difficult? Am I okay? Hello. Thanks for the question, Irvinder. And um, I would like to add upon two of our clients who have given their perspective. We have had one OH team giving their perspective. And coming from an agency, I can definitely give the perspective there that yes, it makes our life a little difficult because if I were to see on that side, I have two clients where I have to justify why am I doing this? And then I have a publisher ecosystem. But coming back to our point, um, our POV, generally what we would see is that a cross-channel actually helps to build trust and it actually helps to build that awareness through consistency of the messaging because if you are able to see the same constant narrative everywhere across mediums, that reminder is constantly happening in the person's mind that you're trying to reach out to because it's already cluttered. We all know we don't want to touch upon that. Um, at the same time, it also helps to get a rich and a detailed analysis of your consumer behavior. So you would know, okay, this particular set of people would convert from this particular channel or someone else would convert from somewhere else. So you could optimize your medias accordingly because you know that where your return on investment is going to be the maximum. So in a way it helps that. And adding on to it further, I believe that that also leads to hyper-personalization, the way everyone has been saying, of course, with the start of cookies and with the demise of cookies that we saw because of the giants that we know are doing it. But all in all, if you would see the whole cross-channel integration helps in addressing these three, if I were to sum it in terms of a benefit. Yeah, no, Suchi, that helps if the, all of these media channels are connected in a certain way. But yeah, we've seen also struggles and problems when the, the channels or media are not connected. Especially it happens in the traditional out of home or maybe on television, linear television. So uh, when you get to programmatic and uh, when the channels are connected, that probably makes the life a little easier. Uh, what is your take on this, uh, Vignesh? Thank you. 
uh, I think the advantage of going last is that uh, people before you have already summed up all the points, right? Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, the premise of uh, a very good advertisement is about showing the right ad to the right person at the right time. I don't think that's changed for whether it's a client or an agency or anybody, right? That premise stays true all the time. Uh, I think cross-channel integration given the fact that um, every channel is now uh, monetizing, right? Ad advertising, advertising has been seen as a core revenue channel for almost every platform. I don't see, I don't think there is any platform nowadays which is not monetizing in one way or another. So with you, your, our ability to be able to see the customer at so many touch points, right? From the time he gets up, checks his phone, that's what we all of us do. And from the time he goes back and logs into his Wi-Fi to the time he goes and sees his TV, her setup box, and from the time he goes back to his offline store, picks up vegetables, or and then goes back to an e-commerce store to buy his shopping, right? You are able to reach the customers across so many touch points, right? How do you ensure that you're not you're actually not uh, building up fatigue? I think that's the important point. We all see ads, yes, great, it's great to uh, reach out to the customer in so many points. How do you ensure you not getting fatigue, right? So that, I think the integration is very important because otherwise you're going to be uh, siloed in terms of your activations. And I think that's super important because I think, I don't think there's any marketer who I've spoken to in the last, I think many years who's, even their brand budgets are now ROI focused. <laughs> Uh, there was a time when there is performance and then brand, but then it's like brand budgets are equivalent to performance budgets nowadays, right? So how do we ensure that you get uh, value for the buck? That's one. Second thing is that when you're having a cross-channel integration, for a lot of brands, it's also a trial and error, right? So how do you figure out which channel works well and how do you uh, optimize on that channel at the right time, right? I think that's super important because I know a lot of brands who we work with who basically have tried a particular channel and then uh, as an experiment would have tried another channel and then it works in silos, right? So how do you figure out what works for you, right? Given that there is a whole gamut of, uh, you know, uh, options that's available. So I think the ability to also manage cost, the ability to optimize, the ability to reduce fatigue, so you're only seeing the ad when you, it matters to you the most. What's the, yes, it great builds great uh, brand recall, etc. yes. But it also builds in fatigue because there are so many different brands going on, right? It is just like those D&D &D calls we keep receiving every day. I'm sure, I'm sure all of us in the room basically get calls every yeah, day, Yeah, right? D&D doesn't work these it days, huh? <laughs> so how do you ensure that we are not doing the same thing back here, right? So that's what I believe a cross-channel integration actually truly delivers. Yeah, no, I think uh, thanks for that perspective uh, and you as Reliance can probably do the best <laughs> because you are mapping the journey of the consumer right from the phone to all channels <laughs> and tracking them everywhere. So uh, that brings to me to the next question in terms of the programmatic possibilities of these channels. Uh, what do you think about television as a programmatic channel or audio um, right. capability? So before we get into that, I think we, uh, people typically use programmatic for two ways, uh, two, I mean, um, objectives. One objective is they want to, con they are tired of talking to 20 different publishers and they are like, okay, let me get one consolidated billing from one DSP and let me use a DSP as one channel for buying. The other one is the truly performance oriented uh, brand which basically says that, you know what, I really want performance, so let me figure out and uh, DSP has got a great bidder, great first party data and they can help deliver for me, right? So I think these two objectives, so it depends on what it is. From a brand perspective, in terms of capabilities, where are we? I think in terms of, uh, I think every channel, whether you talk about CTV uh, or whether you talk about audio, I think there are, from a objective number one, where you want to consolidate everything into one billing, yes, it's possible. But is it truly programmatic in terms of the way it was uh, destined to be, in terms of it being truly biddable, uh, common targeting capabilities, can we do measurement, right, uh, etc. Are we there yet? No, we are not, right. Uh, for example, uh, but I think there has been some growth in certain areas. CTV has got truly remarkable targeting capabilities that we didn't know was possible, right. 
in the geo ecosystem as well we have built up network of uh, otts outside of our own ecosystem where we are able to leverage first party data truly right so the targeting capabilities have come a long way are they programmatically available most of it is yes. right so there is parts of it which are actually growing fast and then there are parts of it which are not keeping in uh, keeping up to it so is it truly programmatic not really but uh, does it serve one or two of the objectives yes yeah no i think we were discussing this earlier also uh, especially audio and if we talk about linear tv um, then probably there are restrictions so city to you uh, how limited uh, connected tv can be if you have to reach out to the larger audiences and how are your clients reacting to the programmatic version of the tv i would say <laughs> So with um, CTV render, what we're seeing, what's happening is that um, scale is obviously something to begin with because it's limited, right? A CTV is still considered as a phenomena that I have a TV that is connected to a digital ecosystem that is facilitating me to watch something online, right? So to begin with, one is the scale. The second piece, like I think Vignesh summed up most of our points now, if I could say, <laughs> since he went first, that the measurement piece is also important because um, the way there is this concept of co-viewing that's happening on CTV, right? The way normal TV happens, that if, a, if it's a family, an average family of four people that we see, the co-viewing happens where the mother might, might be watching some show and all others are tagging along. The same concept happens also in CTV if you were to see. It would be my signed-in device that my parents would be using. So how are we actually measuring that I am to be reached out to for that particular ad or that product via that ad or is it going to be my parents, right? So the measurement still becomes a little difficult and the whole way in which the first party data to be utilized, like we're saying, the signals. Right now, I think India largely is sticking to the content that is being served, whether, you know, what kind of content is being consumed, or at max, we would do a time band targeting the way a TV would facilitate. But we've not made much success going beyond that, where, you know, you can actually get the beauty of programmatic coming in where, uh, while a real-time bidding is happening, but do I get to put my first party data? Um, to a certain extent, some OEM providers are giving us those um, cuts of, you know, the device being so expensive or this particular range where the assumption is this would be an HNI audience or a tier one, tier two city audience along with the geo cut. So I think that is little where the programmatic capability is restricted. That being said, all other capabilities are open, like he expanded. And very interestingly, um, I was reading this article last year where in the Australian market they were experimenting that to the extent of even measuring whether that ad was viewable or not, they're going to put those pixels right on the glass panel to see that the eye movement that's happening is the ads consu getting consumed because that's the attention metric, that's the new kid on the block in the whole measurement space, right? So that is something that the Australian TV manufacturers are now contemplating that do we put that and then do we monetize inventory from there, from that point onwards? Because COVID will still be a factor come what may. So. That no, so measurement is always a, a tricky uh, thing to talk about and uh, especially in this context it becomes uh, very difficult. So in OH uh, Shivalika I know that it's been a challenge for a long time but I think digital is serving some uh, or addressing some of those challenges, no? Uh, I think we all are talking about few of the emerging formats and there are certain emerging formats which have actually evolved with over the period of time, a lot of feedback coming from the marketers. While we talk about programmatic DOH, globally 33% of the advertisers have actually shifted to from a normal traditional DOH to programmatic DOH. Um, and not only this, I was just reading a Group M's report that says that $105 million revenue that is to be clogged alone in DOH by this year and it's going to double down in the next two years. So it is an important medium, but it, is, it has always been in a black box. You don't have, uh, you're just buying a real estate. You don't have measurement, you don't have real-time reporting. So that, that is where Lemma comes as a solution architect and a partner, wherein what we are talking about is you launch, amplify, pause a campaign, you do anything at, with a simple PGD. You don't take, take it as an offline deal altogether. You don't have the hassle of going to multiple vendors. You're just dealing with one simple ad exchange, launching a scalable campaign. We recently did a campaign of launching 15,000 screens go live in one single day. That's the scalability we're talking about. Not only this, there is a real-time reporting. You're not 
any more dependent on proof of play. With real-time reporting, you're also paying for the impressions only. You're not playing for the entire day. Uh, so uh, there's a lot that is happening in programmatic world. When it comes to measurement, we have third-party partners. We do BLS and Kanta study along with the brands, which kind of tell us about the uplift. Not only this, uh, it has gone to such an advanced level wherein we actually we have partners which help brand build their first-party data by collecting MAIDs, which they can further retarget and actually look at a full funnel approach. So, uh, like Vignesh very well said that uh, performance be a branding be a sabko wo magic wand chahiye. You cannot fit into everything. Um, but as in when we are also proceeding in programmatic DOH, we have CTV, OTT, and other um, audio as a format that will be launching very soon as well. Um, connecting the user at multiple touch points and not missing the essence of the medium that's always there, but how to make it more transparent. That is one thing that we have been working upon. There are a lot of uh, brands which actually come to us and say, airport pe hum log teen saal se kharcha kar rahe hain, nahi pata ki whether the audience is there or not. So we also help brands get their dose footfall report, audience analysis, demographics, etc. This might not be exact programmatic, but it's somewhere near. And I'm sure five years down the lane, like she talked about uh, having a camera or a eye sensor, I'm sure the technology will be so AI driven. We might, uh, sitting in the room, the screen can actually count the people, number of people. That's, that's where we will also be able to count maybe audience CPMs as well. So we are getting there and uh, programmatic DOH is one solution wherein all the money that is there, you can actually make it ROI driven, more counted, more measured. Uh, I think an uh, important point that you touched upon and Suchi also spoke about uh, getting the first party information from all of these uh, engagements that you do with the consumers. So, a uh, question to you Sahil, how have you leveraged uh, programmatic uh, mediums or you know, campaigns uh, across all of these touch points to gather that information about consumers? Uh, so, I'll just touch upon an old uh, saying. Uh, you know, in marketing they say that 50% uh, of your monies get wasted, you don't know which ones. Abhi nahi, abhi nahi, So, I think, I think the programmatic journey uh, in our case also pretty much started uh, like this, uh, what Vignesh was mentioning as uh, an experiment uh, at Max Life Insurance uh, half a decade back when we uh, uh, thought, you know, how do we find that rest of the 50% percent jo waste ho usko kaise utilize kare. Uh, and I think the journey has been far more fruitful uh, in the, over the period of time. Largely, the programmatic spends uh, that we uh, have helped us scale our D2C business uh, to a large extent in the past, uh, as I mentioned, uh, half a decade. Uh, now, the programmatic spends are now also moving towards the, uh, you know, the traditional side, which is TV++. We generally call it linear TV and++ includes the CTVs and the OTTs in our world. And uh, the intent is the same, that how do we ensure that uh, uh, whatever money gets spent uh, you know, gets to the right, uh, uh, you know, uh, viewer, uh, whatever first party data that we collect, how are we able to juice, uh, you know, complete, uh, uh, you know, uh, efficiencies out of that uh, particular, you know, uh, audience set. Uh, I think that's the intent and uh, programmatic has really helped us, uh, you know, achieve some of those targets. Yeah. Juicing without creating a fatigue, as he said. <laughs> so, uh, this brings to me another, qu my another question, which is, uh, how are you allocating budgets? So, maybe we can, uh, speak to you or uh, start with you maybe and come to the center because then I don't want to get into a debate of last con bol rahe, first con bol rahe. so uh, sure. how enough. are you allocating the budgets? No, fair enough. I think uh, I'll address that question in two parts. Uh, one is uh, what do we use as an input metric in terms of uh, assessing before we uh, in, in terms of media planning uh, uh, before we execute the campaign and what are the progressive metric which we observe over a period of time to make course corrections. So I think uh, one of the most critical thing to uh, understand or know in the first place is the campaign objective. Uh, you need to be very clear with respect to what you're going after, uh, whether it's awareness or whether it's quality of awareness which is familiarity. Uh, your driving consideration or uh, preference or anything bottom funnel, right? Uh, uh, apart from the campaign objective, I think uh, understanding uh, the user, your target audience is something which uh, you need to invest into, uh, not just uh, in the context of demographics, but what are their media consumption habits. 
uh, that's there. I think uh, also uh, to a certain extent, uh, the channels which you're trying to operate on, are there any kind of an overlap so that uh, you can bring in some kind of a cost efficiency before you uh, uh, get into media execution. And once you've made things live is when you assess as to what is the cost efficiency each channel is bringing in. And if some channel is uh, very expensive is when you can distribute the uh, budget there. Of course, we leave some kind of budget uh, for new and emerging channels as well. So that is uh, something which we always keep aside. And I think a lot of these questions help us answer to uh, give us answer to the other side of question as to whether we want to go behind reach or frequency, what should be the weightage between these two, uh, should it be performance oriented or should it be brand oriented, should it be online investment or should it be an offline investment, uh, should it be linear TV or connected TV is what we are going after. So I think this is how we do uh, budget allocation at Porter basically. Shuchi, uh, do you want to add to that? Uh, because I know your life must be quite complex allocating the budgets across. No, in fact, um, adding on to that, I was just while he was talking, if we were to keep ourselves on that side of the table, for them it's difficult to understand, like we said, measurement. And if we were to put ourselves in the place where we are every day, for us, it's we would want to put out what is the best for the client, right? So in that particular case, like he said, um, I'll, I'll try to stick to the AI rule of what you input, actually you get it as the output, right? So ensuring that the channels that you decide for a cross-channel integration first, we decide upon that. Of course, like you said, experiments are needed, which is what we also propose to clients, typically at an agency level, that you know you should park 10-20% of your budgets in experiment. Um, those channels where we've seen successes in the past is also that you know we continue building in. And at the same time, the newer channels also get the scope to come into play, because not that we continuously do that, because then that becomes an always-on sort of a thing. So um, that being said, could be one of the ways in which we are trying to tackle this situation. Uh, along with that consistently, I would still say that because this is still fragmented like we just spoke in the last half an hour, the messaging has to be consistent across so that we are not showcasing a particular piece on one channel and the same communication is completely different so that the consumer is not able to tie that whole thing to a brand per se. That is the second thing that I would want to say. And the third piece is eventually, like all of us said again, and I keep on saying that for all advertisers, it's very important in terms of the measurement as to how do we prove the success of that particular piece, right? So given with whatever, wherever the industry stands today, if you are able to make sense and show an impact in whatever forms it is for us as an advertiser is where we should be heading into typically. Uh, Sahil, any example from your brand that you want to just talk about uh, using programmatic uh, cross-channel integration? Uh, what I mentioned about the uh, large, you know, uh, the, the top of the funnel starting from a television and then eventually leading up to uh, uh, a typical bottom funnel, you know, uh, wherein uh, our, our uh, large, you know, uh, integrations with the platforms are deep enough to actually give us uh, uh, a good efficiency on the overall funnel. I think that those are the examples that uh, have really worked well for us. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, the ideal world that we have you not know, tried to paint right now, I think where everything will be measurable hoga and everything you know, will be uh, uh, easily, uh, be, we'll be able to track. I think that world is yet to come and we are really hoping that that comes soon. What has been your experience? Uh? Oh, multiple, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. So we work with more than 200 plus brands. At a vertical level, I think uh, we have seen success. A anything exciting that you want to talk to the or I think, tell uh, the audience? Definitely the fintech uh, space, I think, has been super important, right? I think they are trying to boost uh, payments as well. Um, so we were able to leverage on a campaign. Typically, we go in digital first campaigns and then we are able to execute, etc. But we were actually able to do this across multiple ecosystems. We are digital and to our connected set-top boxes and as well as the retail outlets, right? So where you say go to a retail outlet, so typically the idea was to basically capture them at say 9 in the morning, 12, uh, 12 1 o'clock in the afternoon and then back in the evening, right? So how do we connect all these touch points, right? And then the way we measure them is on a combination of two things because all these channels are separate, right? They are not connected. 
So in sum, it was definitely a brand lift study basically gives you because a lot of times purchase is not immediate but you are able to see the uh, input metrics rise. So I think multiple uh, examples uh, on, on that side as well. Uh, but happy to share uh, with the larger team, anybody wants to understand, happy to share multiple more offline. No, so there are many interesting examples, like we were talking about Lenscard and I was uh, with that team in the morning. Uh, they are trying this uh, experience of uh, using or experiencing the product online and then uh, go and uh, you know test out the product in the shop. So that's the kind of omni-channel experience that uh, they are trying to offer to their uh, audiences. Um, any learnings uh, for the audience uh, from your experience that they should be careful about or they should uh, be worried about? I can go there. Hmm. Um, I think um, the expectation is that uh, if you have an omni-channel ecosystem, uh, the, uh, um, everything is at the same level in terms of targeting, in terms of measurement, in terms of addressability, is it the same? No. I think uh, multiple channels are at multiple stages of evolution, which are moving fast, some are not moving so fast. And I think there is a trial and error uh, that is associated with all. Um, so I think one learning is that I think we are, while we are fast evolving, I think we just need a little bit more uh, patience. I think that is something that is uh, required. Yeah. Anyone wants to, we will keep maybe 30 seconds for the audience if there are any questions. But yeah, anyone who wants to add, uh, what are the learnings and that people should be cautious? Yes, please. So um, I think uh, left in Lema, I have, uh, every day is a learning. Uh, we learn a lot from our brand marketers, from partners. Um, one thing that we have actually observed is there are certain brands which are actually globally evolved and programmatic. They're already doing traditional DOH, but for them moving, they're the early movers in this category. So I think the learning that has been tremendously for us is there are certain brands which are very stubborn. They don't want to move into programmatic world altogether. This is something which, which is, which is completely no no right now. So I think uh, it's very important for a brand or a marketer to understand whether they can be a future or they can wait for the future. So this is the time when there are emerging formats, it's the time when they can be actually part of that brand back and, and contribute to the learnings which all the platforms can evolve together. Well said, I think one needs to be a part of the growing or evolving curve rather than jumping it late, in it later. Um, so time is up, but uh, maybe 30 seconds for any questions from the audience, unless they're sleeping. <laughs>